to a special roundtable of state Senate candidates in Greater Portland. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're hosting a one-hour forum for candidates running for the main state Senate in the nine Senate districts served by the Greater Portland Council of Governments. I'm Christina Egan, your moderator. Before we begin the conversation with our candidates, I'd like to share a few notes. The Greater Portland Council of Governments, or as we call it, GPCOG, is a nonpartisan agency that works with every member of the legislature. Our conversation today is about policy, not politics. GPCOG serves 25 cities and towns in our region, so our discussion today is going to focus on municipal issues. And because of very tight schedules in this busy election season, many Senate candidates in our region could not attend today's forum, and they send their regrets. I'm going to ask a series of questions and offer each of our candidates two minutes to respond. We'll go in clockwise order for each question, and I'll start with a different candidate on each question. If a candidate feels the need for rebuttal time or to clarify, they can ask me and I'll give them one minute at my discretion. Because time is short, I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves as you respond to our first question. So let's get started. Rick, you're our first one up. Why are you running for a seat in the Maine State Senate? Well, um, I'm Rick Bennett. I have the honor of serving the people of 14 towns in, uh, in Western Maine in the state Senate currently. And I might say I might, I actually probably um, stretch the definition of Greater Portland uh, when you think about the places I represent, because I represent from Freiburg and Brownfield on the New Hampshire line, across through the Bridgeton Harrison area, which is in Cumberland County, over to the Oxford Hills, and then to the outskirts of Lewis and Auburn and mine at Mechanic Falls. And I've I've had um, the pleasure of serving now since 2020, but I had earlier service in the House and the Senate and uh, had served in the late 90s and uh, through the early aughts, as we say, and, um, and had served as president of the Senate when we had a tied Senate back then. I decided to run for re-election because I think politics is broken and we need to fix it. And I thought, uh, you know, maybe I had something with my previous experience, my business experience, my family experience that I could bring in a unique way to contribute to today's discussions about, uh, about many, many issues. But I think fundamentally we have a broken polit politics that um, you know, money is metastasized, um, particularly dark money in politics. Um, there's a lot of polarization, hyperpartisanship. People don't talk to each other anymore. Um, and a lot of decision making done in caucuses rather than on the floor of the Senate. Um, Having said that, you know, I've worked with many of the other people here on the, uh, in the program today uh, very constructively on a whole range of issues in a bipartisan way. So I, I've been enjoying uh, coming back to the legislature and actually getting work done for the people I represent. Thank you so much, Rick. Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Nagel. Uh, I represent uh, Senate District 26, which is uh, Casco, Raymond, Wyndham, Fry Island, and parts of Westbrook. I'm running to represent my district um, and ensure that we continue to have clean air and water, um, affordable prescription medications, and uh, lower property taxes where possible. Um, it's important to me that uh, we continue to make Maine a place where people can thrive and uh, have good jobs, good benefits, and um, just have an overall good life. Thank you, Tim. Anne. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Anne Carney. I represent Senate District 29, which includes South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and a little bit of Scarborough, kind of the northeastern corner. I serve as the Senate Chair of the Judiciary Committee, and I also serve on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee and I'm the Senate Chair of the Gun Safety Caucus in the legislature. And I am running for re-election because I want to continue serving my constituents. The issues that they care about I think are really important to our state, including um, increased gun safety, environmental protection, which is a, a very significant issue in South Portland in particular because of the oil terminal facilities, um, and housing, which I know is a statewide priority. But I'm excited to be working on all of those again next year. Yeah, so my name is Dustin Ward, um, and I'm running as an independent uh, for the District 20, uh, which is New, uh, New Gloucester, Auburn, Poland, and Durham. 
Uh, and I want to say thank you for, for having me here and excited to be uh, with this great uh, team here as well. Um, what I tell folks initially is I'm just a kid from Aroostook County. I uh, grew up in Prescott, I'm a graduate of Prescott High School in 06. And I have that background and that uh, understanding of lo local and rural uh, politics uh, to aid me in what I've been doing the last three years, which is uh, I was elected to uh, the select board here in New Gloucester uh, in 2021 and been serving in that capacity and now chair. And so for me, uh, I'm running to, one, be a voice for many unheard or small municipalities that tend to not have their voice uh, in politics. Uh, and similar to what Rick said, you know, a lot of the, the politics now is conversation that's broken. Um, and so I'm hoping to bring practical solutions to a lot of the conversations that have been stalled. And then finally, one of the, the big things that I hope to bring is I'm a facilitator at heart. Um, it's part of what I also do in my, my day, daytime job as a racial equity and reconciliation advocate. So I'm hoping to facilitate um, and bring both sides together to find those practical solutions. Um, so I'm excited for, for the race that I'm in and uh, really been enjoying sort of getting to learn along the way, although I'm not there yet. I'm hopefully looking forward to representing uh, my district in November. Thank you so much, Justin. Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Brenner, and I represent uh, most of Scarborough, the part that um, Senator Carney doesn't represent, and all of Gorham in the Maine State Senate. I am the Senate Chair of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and I've also served on the Veteran and Legal Affairs Committee and the Health Coverage, Insurance, and Financial Services Committee. I'm a Senate representative on the Climate Council and also the Senate Chair of the PFAS Advisory Fund. Um, I am looking forward to being reelected so that I can go back and continue to do good work for my constituents around democracy and protecting justice and human rights. I find that one of the superpowers of being a legislator is that you have uh, the opportunity to convene people for stakeholder meetings and to dig deep into issues. And I'm looking forward to continuing to use that opportunity to move conversations forward for issues that really are meaningful for not only Scarborough and Gorham, but also the greater state around housing and education climate change and clean energy, uh, smart growth, and um, all the other things that are meaningful for a good life here in the state of Maine. Thank you so much, Stacey. All right, our first question is gonna go to you, Tim. I mean, our, sorry, our second question, which is around housing. Um, in 2022, the state passed LD 2003, a new law directing municipalities to adjust their zoning to welcome more housing development. Since then, housing construction has increased, but we still have more housing to build to meet the state's housing production goals. What role should the legislature play in continuing the effort to build enough new housing in our region and across Maine? We'll start with you, Tim, and then we'll go down the line. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> in the previous budget, this, uh, we, we invested over $100 million uh, in, try, in attempts to create affordable housing. Those attempts uh, have been successful in some point. Um, the high points are we have eviction prevention programs to keep people in their current living situation. Um, we have uh, assistance for um, lower income buyers. They can get assistance with their closing costs if they buy a home. And we've also given incentives to developers to create affordable housing uh, projects. Um, I think we need to evaluate those programs and see if they're actually, how they're working. Um, obviously, we can't just pop up um, housing overnight. And I think uh, we can continue to uh, evaluate those and decide whether or not we need to increase the availability of those or try different programs. Okay, thank you. Right, yeah, and I'll just pick up on, on what Tim said about evaluation because I think that's really the role of the legislature. We're the policymakers in state government, and um, we've become aware as policymakers that our state hasn't taken a lead in setting housing policy. And so I think that that's our role to determine uh, where the gaps are in um, our housing uh, the options for housing in our state. So for example, we know that there's kind of an across the board deficit in housing, all kinds of dwelling units at every uh, level of affordability. But we've seen things like um, the lack of housing with 
uh, for people who are unhoused who need services in order to stay housed. And so we just um, this past session created the Housing First program, which will be a really wonderful um, proven program um, to uh, help unhoused people not only get housing in the immediate time frame, but then to become stably housed over the rest of their lives. Thank you. Justin. So a uh, couple of different things. One thing that I think the legislator could do is really think about this in, in three different ways. There's workforce housing, affordable housing, and traditional housing. And I think if you separate those three out, you can have three different conversations to get you to some practical solutions. From a municipality side, uh, what we've seen is when there's um, an opportunity, it's the available land that we have access to. And one of the big things is we enacted, when uh, LD 2003 got enacted, we began to go through a process of changing our zoning. Not every municipality has either done that or um, has the ability to do that in a quick way. And so it can hold up a lot of the housing that could take place. Um, another big thing for our, our municipality specifically is even if we find specific land, the amount of money it takes to go through engineering, studies, um, what it takes to just prepare a piece of land to actually build housing on it, some municipalities may not, have, may not have the budget for that. So I think one of the key things is working with municipalities and their budgetary options to be able to make that, um, that leap to have housing in a specified piece of land. One of the other things that I know the legislature has already done is LD1721, which I think is transitional housing, um, using a nonprofit to sort of um, improve how we get individuals into housing opportunities. Can we invest more in that in terms of the um, uh, housing options that we have? And my other thing that uh, I really, I want to begin to really think about is can um, those who are renters, and this would have to work with landlord, landlords as well, but can renters gain equity uh, while they're renting? And I think that oftentimes is a really key piece about being a first time home buyer or buying that next home, is can you have equity in the rental market? Um, there'd be a lot of pieces I know to work out, but it's something that I think could at least be a new avenue that we haven't thought of. So I offer maybe those three as options that LD2003 has given us sort of a, a view uh, or a lens into what we could do with housing. Thank you, Justin. All right, Stacy. Well, my smart friends here all speak my mind, but I will add a few things. Um, I think that the figure that floats around is 84,000 units of housing are needed in order to alleviate our housing crisis. So that looks like housing on all levels. So when you build new housing, uh, for example, to allow um, seniors to downsize, you free up a unit that allows a first-time home buyer to enter the market. So making sure that there's opportunities for first-time home buyers to be supported in their ability to have a down payment. Uh, the Housing First program is crucial to making sure that we have a robust social safety net to support our most vulnerable folks that are seeking housing and are in need of a place to, to rest their head. Um, so when I think about housing, I think about heads and beds and how can we have as broad of a brush stroke of types of housing available for folks. And I think the Maine's, Maine's legislature and our executive branch's investment in housing over the last session has been really unprecedented. And watching how Maine housing unrolls and unveils that money across the state in all communities, rural, suburban, urban, is going to be really important. So that evaluation component will be crucial. But for Scarborough and Gorham, Senate District 30 was the fastest growing um, district in all of the states. So there was a point in 2021-22 um, where I represented more people than anyone in the state of Maine just based on growth. So for a region like, like southern Maine, we need to think about what it looks like to invest in all of the other infrastructure associated with housing so that it makes it easier for municipalities to say yes around traffic, around school growth and um, municipal services. So if we don't figure out how to support municipalities in that kind of growth, we're not going to be able to get them to say yes to housing in the way that the state sees the need um, and how we're going to meet it. Yeah, I've I, you know, watched with dismay uh, some of the voting at the municipal level on some housing projects, uh, you know, where people have shut the door for whatever reason, nimbyism or just whatever the concerns might be. And I think, I, I don't know if everybody in our state really shares the, uh, the, the sense that I'm hearing all of us share about the, the, the dire need for housing that we have. It is absolutely a supply issue and it's, that 84,000 units that uh, Stacy spoke about is just to kind of keep pace with known demand. If our economy grows at all, we're going to be severely, um, uh, severely short, short on housing. 
Um, I come from a, a town, actually, that um, had a very robust manufacturing housing industry, uh, Oxford, where we had 1,000 people in Oxford um, just 20 years ago working in providing housing. They were manufacturing plants, had five manufacturing plants, building modular and mobile homes. We had set crews, we have retailers, we have haulers, people who drove these houses in boxes all across New England. And with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, that entire industry has disappeared. Uh, the three of the, uh, the plants that were making housing uh, are, are shuttered, they've been converted to other purposes. Two of them, they're growing medical marijuana in them. Um, uh, one is open, the other one is, is uh, mothballed. And uh, I, I'd like to, I think we need to uh, deal with the supply issue aggressively and we should think domestically. What are main strengths? We still have a lot of talented people in the Oxford community who know this business and could be re-employed in this business uh, and want to work in this business. I was talking with some the other day. Uh, but we need to provide some incentives, I think. And there have been some pilot programs uh, using manufactured housing made in Maine to provide affordable housing ac across rural Maine. Um, and I think, I think that we, we, need to, um, we need to investigate that. And so we're also going to need to look at other states, like uh, Colorado has a, a, a program where, that they've recently passed to stimulate domestic manufactured housing using domestic Colorado natural resources. Well, we have lots of woods here in Maine, and, and we got the building supplies, we got the we got the people. Uh, Pennsylvania has a thing, a program called Whole Home Repair, and particularly in rural Maine, um, we have a lot of dilapidated housing that needs to be repaired in order to be habitable, and that's an opportunity for us as well. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to do a quick follow up, and I'm going to start with you and just on housing. So, we need 84,000 units, one of you said, mm -hmm. um, and we also know that it matters where the housing goes. How do you see housing kind of nestling into our communities? Do you have any thoughts about where the housing ought to go as municipalities are thinking about their land use? And Anne, I'm gonna, we'll do one minute each on this. Okay. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I think that we know from an environmental perspective that it's really important to have the housing near the jobs and near the schools. And so, um, you know, in, in Senate District 29, what that looks like is continuing to um, build housing close to the municipal centers in the district. And um, I, I like that concept because it also allows communities that have a lot of green space, like South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and Scarborough, to continue to maintain those green spaces with their environmental benefits, as well as reducing um, use of fossil fuels and transportation. Great. Dustin. Uh, two that come to mind. One is specifically for New Gloucester. I've always said the last three years is to think about what is the conserved land that we've been holding. We may be holding too much and there may be key places uh, that we could put housing. Um, that's a larger conversation for the municipality. But um, just considering what are you holding uh, and what can you can you work with. The other thing I think the state legislature, the state legislature passed LD 492, which is using vacant um, spaces or vacant retail spaces. So a lot of malls or other spaces, I think some schools have been repurposed. Um, those actually work really quickly because the plumbing and the um, structure is already in place. So again, looking at some of those um, vacant lots or vacant spaces that were previously retail and converting those into housing may be a, a short term, um, something that can be looked at in terms of where you would put housing. Thanks. Susan. Thanks for the question. Um, I think all of the conversation around smart growth is really crucial in uh, Scarborough and Gorham, making sure we take advantage of the opportunities for infill development in spaces that are already paved over in some way is uh, some of the most effective spots we can focus housing efforts out of the gate. Um, and I think it's crucial to have set aside conservation land and hold it up in high regard and not compromise it for construction of new housing because we, we do have plenty of opportunities to put housing into other spaces without compromising that conservation opportunity. It allows for the growth of communities to have the ability to access green space no matter where you are. So we want everyone to be able to access a park or a hiking trail in the town of Scarborough without having to go too far so that it's not 
out of anybody's capacity to reach those spaces and enjoy them and grow up with them as children and um, access them as seniors. I think maybe my district has a different a different needs uh, from what I'm hearing from people who are more congested in the greater Portland area proper. Uh, I, uh, we've got lots of land in rural Maine, um, not too far from here. Um, my house is about a 35 minute drive from, from downtown Portland. And um, I think it's probably next, uh, that whole region is next for the growth. What's really critical is affordability. and. I think we need to have a new view about development, much more cluster-oriented development, because in a lot of places in rural and suburban Maine, there are minimum lot sizes, which frustrate the opportunity for developers to really provide good services while providing for green space and recreational opportunities that most Maine people want, whether they live in more urban Portland area or suburban or rural Maine. They want to be close to recreation. They want to be close to the outdoors. Yeah, so much harmony here. Tim. So out. there's three concepts in, in um, real estate, and it's uh, location, location, and location. Um, I, I, I want to echo what Senator Bennett said. It, people want to live near recreation. They also want to live near their work. Um, I think that's, that's an important uh, factor as well. Uh, each town generates a, on every 10 years, they should be creating a new comprehensive plan. Um, when I was on the town council in Wyndham, we accepted a new comprehensive plan and we designated growth areas and areas in town that we wanted to keep rural. Um, and we incentivized the developers to uh, build in the growth areas and uh, made it, I don't want to say harder, but made it um, the rural areas grow slower um, so that they're not, you know, plowing in empty fields. Um, and I think that those are the, the things that matter most to people is, is keeping those um, conserved areas available for recreation, hiking, biking, whatever, and also trying to make it easy for them to get to, to work or to shop. Great. Thanks, Tim. All right. Justin, we're going to start with you for the next question, which is about our changing climate. All right. So last winter's storms and this year's floods have increased municipal focus on disaster preparedness and also climate action to reduce emissions. And it's anticipating future weather disruptions. That's one of the things that many municipalities are starting to think about. What role should state government play in helping municipalities be better prepared for climate emergencies? If I were to say it from the municipality perspective, um, I would love to see the state ledger hold aside a, a set amount of funds that would be in preparation for damage um, and funds for any damage that have happened within the municipality. Um, preparation is a, is a different concept, um, but I think when those um, severe storms have happened in the last year and the damages have exceeded um, far what the municipality has been prepared for, um, it, it would be a a, a real benefit to know that there are set aside funds that the municipality could tap into. One of the things that we found that was difficult uh, in terms of gaining uh, funds back was that we had to hit a certain threshold for both our municipality and the southern, uh, our Cumberland County region. Um, we had to hit almost a million, 1.6 6 million in damages to be able to get federal funds. So that becomes very hard when a municipality isn't prepared or, or does not know how to accumulate or calculate all of that. Um, it was one of the first times we really had to think through um, how simple uh, rainstorms had turned into um, washing out roads. So I would see that the state ledger set aside a specific amount of funds that the municipality could tap into. Um, preparation would be uh, more forward thinking um, and assisting in, I think, a lot of regionalization, which is what I think a lot of municipalities are starting to talk about. Um, more so when we talk about plowing roads, public works, um, a lot of municipalities are having trouble keeping up with the rising costs. So when we're in preparation mode, um, being able to work with other municipalities in our surrounding area would actually be helpful. If the state leg legislature can broker or bridge some of those regionalization conversations, that would be huge. Uh, so just two simple things in, in regards to your question. Thank you, Dustin. Stacy. One of the most effective things I think the state has already done is through GOPIF, the Governor's Office of Policy, Innovation in the Future, to help 
fund the development of climate resiliency plans on the community level, the municipality level. So bringing in a diverse set of community members to feed into a plan that allows the town to have some document prepared that is a uh, response to what they would envision some of the challenges would be as a result of climate change. So what is it going to look like when the tide rises, uh, the river crests, um, the storm knocks out power, uh, what emergency services are going to look like if the road washes out, are we going to be able to get residents uh, through in emergency vehicles if they need to be transported somewhere. So those climate resiliency plans have also led to the state providing the small grants, they're not large enough, but small grants to be able to implement parts of that climate resiliency plan on the ground in the town. So does that look like a battery, uh, a gener battery power generator of some sort that allows some part of town services to continue functioning, just a, an example. But um, I think that kind of community level input is crucial because we at the state are never gonna be able to have the nuanced response to what specific communities need. Communities need to be able to come up with those responses on their own. The state, I think, can provide the kind of guidance and support for larger grant applications at the federal level and um, resources to develop and think through that plan, but you really need each individual community to bring their um, members together to be able to build out that, that plan. Great, thanks Stacey. Rick? Yeah, I, I wanted to speak about this uh, too because this has been, uh, the, the climate resiliency um, work has been really beneficial to my community and it's something which is undersubscribed and we've provided more funding for it. In the last budget, I serve on the Appropriations Committee and have been championing uh, this spending uh, through the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, which Stacy called GOPIF. Um, they do really good work in this area. And in my area, they um, have been working with a local group called the Citizens for an Ecology-Based Economy, a very innovative group of people locally who have taken on projects like this to help spread the word. They've gone out to towns like Norway and Otisfield and sat down with them in a community setting and talked about climate change as something that we all have to deal with. And sometimes in rural Maine, people push back on climate change because there are varying views about what it means to them. But usually those conversations lead to like, whatever we think about the solutions to climate change, we are all in this together as a community in mitigation. So they do the assessments, they find out what those things are that a particular town needs, and they build the local support. That is a great program. We need to make sure it's funded because I agree also that, that this, these decisions need to be made at the local level. Uh, you, you get down to really kind of dull topics, but important ones like mm -hmm. the size of culverts <laughs> and planning when you're doing road projects for putting in a bigger culvert. Now, people don't necessarily think like this unless they actually can see the science behind the changing demands that are required of our infrastructure. Thank you. Tim? So I think um, planning is important. Um, as, as a paramedic, I, um, I worked on many disaster planning events. Um, and without a comprehensive plan, things just tend to go sideways. Um, as Senator Bennett said, that, uh, you know, increasing sizes of culverts, building roads to a higher level, all of these things uh, are simple to do, but uh, take additional funding and, um, again, planning. Um, I fully support uh, GOPIF's uh, mission of assisting municipalities with with preparing for these events and I don't think they're going to get any less uh, catastrophic um, to, uh, and I think that um, the staff at GOPIF are very have been very helpful to a lot of municipalities and they should reach out. Yeah, thank you Tim. Yeah. I don't have a lot to add um, but I'll focus on the the kinds of things that the legislature can do in addition to funding and providing resources mm. that are um, fixes in anticipation of uh, sea level rise, for example. Um, 
so we can make statutory changes that uh, save municipalities the time and energy of dealing with um, changing all of their ordinances. One example is a bill that I think Stacy offered that had to do with um, how you um, measure the height of a building, which is set by a zoning ordinance in light of the need to increase the baseline level of buildings above um, sea level. And so we passed legislation that created a, a sweeping change across all state law so that when you're changing the baseline of a building, you don't lose your ability to go to the allowed height under the zoning ordinance. Basically, the whole uh, building height is elevated. And I think that, that there are things like that that we can do as a state to set policy that saves municipalities some of the time and energy to do that as well. That's great. I'm going to do a quick follow-up, another one-minute follow-up. So we talked a little bit about climate preparedness for municipalities. What do you think is the state's role in supporting municipalities as they're trying to mitigate their emissions? And Stacy, I'd like to start with you. I think we need to really focus on what a clean and just clean energy transition is going to look like for the state of Maine. We need to keep moving forward and not lose, um, lose our momentum towards getting to the point where we are energy independent. We've reduced our greenhouse gases based on the statutory uh, limit that we've set for ourselves meeting our goal. And there's multiple ways we can do that. There's individual opportunities at the level of home ownership where you can, and municipality and business ownership where you can put in things like heat pumps. We started out with a goal of 100,000 heat pumps and we met that goal two years early and then we increased it ambitiously to 175,000 heat pumps and we're on our way to meet that as well. So initial opportunities for the individual level and then much larger opportunities like making sure we have streamlined effective permitting for solar installations and that we're moving forward with offshore wind. We have an unbelievable opportunity with offshore wind to set Maine up for a once in a century economic development opportunity with a port. And despite the controversy around the location of the port, the opportunity to build and service the offshore wind industry for Maine is crucial. The um, offshore wind Procurement is also essential for Maine. We have an opportunity to be an exporter of energy, and I think we need to really capitalize on that opportunity. Thank you, Stacey. Rick, one minute. Yeah, your question was really about the uh, what the state should do to help um, municipalities with emissions uh, and planning and control. I think really very little. I think uh, most municipalities are led by public-spirited people who they know what the problems are, they know what the challenges are. They have to balance, you know, com the competing thoughts about, well, how long do we keep this current infrastructure going, the furnaces running and all of that, and when should we convert? Um, I think trying to do that from a state level and telling municipalities when to do that and how to do that is very problematic. And, and I think informational resources, setting goals uh, that are aggressive is useful. Uh, but you can quickly get a lot of blowback from municipal leaders who are struggling with a lot of problems, part of which are created by other state policies uh, budgetarily. So I think uh, it, it, I would be a very light hand on this particular one. Thanks, Rick. Tim. I think uh, incentives and grant funding are two ways that we can support municipalities uh, trying to reduce their emissions. Um, Goals are, are a good tool as well, um, and obviously they would need to be reasonable, but I agree, I'm a, a huge fan of local control, and uh, I believe that cities and towns should try and make those decisions for themselves. Thanks, Tim. Anne? I think the state has a, a very significant responsibility in helping municipalities reduce emissions. So one of the, uh, the communities that I represent, South Portland, is the home to most of Maine's oil terminal facilities. And it's really burdened by the use of uh, petroleum-based products throughout our state because when the petroleum products come into the community, they're offloaded. There are emissions that are very um, noxious and have harmful uh, 
chemicals in them. So I think um, two ways that, um, two roles that the state has is to support municipalities by enforcing current regulations. And then we can also help municipalities prepare for that post-fossil fuel future that we're looking at. Um, and one way we have done that is to require the owners of those oil terminal facilities when they're no longer in operation to have on reserve the cleanup and dismantling costs that will save municipalities and taxpayers throughout our state the financial burden of dealing with the dismantling and cleaning up of those facilities. Thank you. Dustin. Um, I would err on the side of, of the home rule, as some have said, and I think the state's responsibility is one in the infrastructure. If you're going to allow uh, municipalities to sort of chart their own course and at least build an infrastructure that allows the municipality to even have that choice that makes sense. Um, so building some of the infrastructure of what we're trying to see, my, my biggest concern when we try to shift to more EVs is, okay, where's the infrastructure to charge it? Uh, there are only specific uh, locations. So if you mandate that across all municipalities, they're all, they're all going to ask, okay, where am I going to put it? And you're making me do this and it doesn't fit for my community. So I tend to have sort of a, a lighter touch. The other thing too is the tax incentives to make an individual um, or municipality help its um, constituents to make the choice to say, do I want to enter into that, the, to that journey uh, of uh, reducing emissions? And the last thing that, that I'll bring up too is um, the state should at least be a facilitator, but not, but not mandate. And I only bring up that because I remember as a kid up in Aroostook County, um, Grove and Prescott, the uh, windmills that, that are there currently that sit up in Mars Hill. Um, I remember watching those go up and seeing those from my lawn. And I remember the conversations about the aesthetics um, and how that detracted. And now you're so used to seeing them that um, they play, you know, no major impact on, on my life personally, but I still think that there's uh, a conversation about aesthetics. And um, similar to what Stacy was saying, there could be consternation about that. So I think the state should be more of a facilitator, but not mandate where things go. Yeah. Um, and in those three ways, maybe that can be that light touch, but also pushing um, for us to move in the right direction. Thank you, Dustin. Rick, we're back to you for the first respondent to a question, and it's about public transportation, which you don't have very much in your region, but we'll, we'll start with you anyway about this. So Maine lags the nation when it comes to investing in public transportation. At the same time, more Maine people need and want to get out of their car or don't have the option to be able to drive anymore as they get older. Do you support increased state investment in public transportation? And how would you fund a meaningful increase in state uh, public transportation funding. Yeah, I'll t be honest and tell you that um, this is not an area that I get a lot of call on uh, in my district. But having said that, there are parts of the public in transportation infrastructure which I think are in going through a wrenching change right now, um, and that has to do with um, Medicaid and other people in need being able to get to appointments and uh, our system's ability to provide that care. The state uh, recently moved away from some of the, um, some of the CAP agencies uh, who were providing this and gave a statewide um, contract to a company called Motive Care. And I've been corresponding vigorously with the Department of Health and Human Services about some of the complaints that I've heard uh, that from multiple people about that kind of, of help. And these are people who need to get to medical appointments. Um, in rural Maine, we don't have a lot of infrastructure, as you said, uh, a lot of ability for people to get to doctor's appointments. Generally, they're farther away, and, um, and the system needs to work for them. And so when I think about public transportation, I think about those who are most in need, who w the state has already accepted responsibility for making sure have care or other services and we're just falling down on the job on that. And um, is, I think we need to uh, really make sure that we have the best infrastructure across rural Maine for, um, for that kind of service, uh, first and foremost. Um, I know you might be also talking about buses and Amtrak and things like that. I'll let others who deal with that respond. But I really believe that we all have seen the, the issues that, uh, that I've just mentioned. And it's a statewide concern. Thank you, Rick. Tim. So I face uh, two problems in our district. You know, one is the, as Rick said, the mode of uh, care transportation issues, and also just uh, 
generalized public transportation. Um, we have a bus that comes out of Portland and uh, does various pickups in Wyndham. Unfortunately, they're not in useful places, so it doesn't get a lot of uh, use. But I think to help fund that, there's, there should be federal money uh, that's available, state money that's available, and then uh, obviously a municipal share and fares. Um, you're never going to fully fund a, a public transportation system, system with fares, but I think it's reasonable to um, expect the federal government and the state government to chip in and, and assist people. Um, I sit on a, a committee uh, looking at issues related to driver's education, and we've decided that uh, having a driver's license is a essential requirement uh, to getting a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the roadblocks that are put up to getting those people into driver's education and getting their licenses um, necessitates, I think, some form of public transportation. Thanks, Tim. Ann. Um, well, I, I will echo what uh, Tim said about public transportation. We do really need more public transportation. Two of the municipalities in my district don't have a any kind of a bus system. And when I think about um, transportation issues, I think about um, the fact that transportation is one of our two highest sources of petroleum emissions. And so if we can provide public transportation, we'll help reduce petroleum emissions, particularly if um, we utilize electric buses. It's a great opportunity to start to convert um, our transportation system to electricity. Um, and then secondly, and I can't remember which of my colleagues said this earlier, but we do want Maine to be um, a state that's welcoming and kind of works for everybody, whether you're a 12-year-old trying to get to the library to do your homework or you're uh, an 85-year-old trying to get to one of the OLLI programs at the University of Southern Maine. You should be able to have reliable bus transportation to take you to the, the things that either you need, like medical appointments, or that enrich your life. Thanks, Ann. Dustin. Mine will be short and sweet because I think we know the need is there, uh, especially in rural communities, as you've heard others say, is um, the, be, the ability to get to appointments, to get to places, because you know some of uh, the communities I represent, we don't have everything in one local area. You have to go somewhere else to, to get either groceries or medical appointments. Um, so I recognize that the, the need is there. Um, but the thing that always comes up is cost and, and how does that affect each municipality's um, burden that they would have to share. But one place that this conversation has come up very specifically to New Gloucester is the rail to trail system or trail to rail or however it's, it's being discussed. I think the state needs to be more clear um, or continue to push that forward so that municipalities can prepare one way or the other. And I think that's what's difficult, especially for New Gloucester, is to know um, what should we be preparing for in terms of costs and how that will look for our community um, and how can we either support it or how do we prepare for it? Because to have that opportunity, um, to have that ability to travel from one place to another using um, rail has always been talked about. Um, but again, we always go back to the, to the cost and I think those are the major questions that so many municipalities ask. Um, so short and sweet for me, I know the need is there. We need sort of a public transportation for a lot of our rural communities. Um, but the state should be more clear on what are the things it's going to fund and how it's going to impact each of those municipalities specifically. Okay. Thank you. So before moving to Maine 25 years ago, I lived in Philadelphia. I was a single mom going to grad school at Penn and rode the bus all, or the subway or the trolley all the time. Kid on the hip, tried to close down that stroller and hop on, got groceries that way, went to class that way. So I have a great deal of um, empathy for folks that need access to public transportation, having been that single mom myself. And I think that when you look at GP Cog's transportation studies, repeatedly residents in Cumberland County want access to public transit. It doesn't have to be buses, it could be vans until we have enough ridership to move up to a bus. So we can right size the vehicle for the need and grow into it, 
But we have to start somewhere and we have to develop something because the interest and the capacity exists. We just need to build it so that people can experience it and take a seat and ride the bus. Great. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks for the shout out to GP Cog. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, we'll start with you for the next question, which is on property tax relief. So residential property values have spiked in the last five years, resulting in much larger property tax bills for homeowners across our entire greater Portland region and Lakes region also. Taxpayers are upset, and yet municipal officials still face increasing costs with limited property tax resources. Is it time for the state to do more to reduce the property tax burden and help homeowners and municipalities? So we currently fund revenue sharing at 5%. Um, that's an increase over the previous administration, uh, gubernatorial administration. Um, and we're continuing, and I'm, I am committed to continuing to fund schools at 55%. Um, could we increase revenue sharing? That would be a budget discussion. And, um, you know, as we know, revenue sharing is, is there to keep essential services going and for, for communities, whether it be police and fire, uh, EMS. Um, I think the, realistically, the only way that we, we could help municipalities would be to increase those revenue sharing either revenue sharing or school funding. Um, I'm open to both if the uh, finances are there. Um, and uh, I, I, I also, you know, I, I hear about this every day on doors. And I give, I give people the reality that um, the community does need to be involved in the budget creation process. And that's the best way to um, to hopefully moderate some of the tax increases, but I think that uh, the community should be the community's integral in creating the budget process. Thanks, Tim. Anne. Um, so I'll, I just will address one issue that um, we've accomplished recently: a policy change that I think is really terrific. It's a property tax deferral program. It's one of the innovative um, programs we have that would allow someone, uh, an older person, if they chose to basically defer property tax payments, the state would step in and, and pay them. And this allows someone to remain in their home and not worry about property taxes until they've moved out of that home or passed away, at which point um, the state would then recoup the payments that it made on behalf of that person. Um, but that's a really kind of a backwards looking system in some ways. And another innovative thing that I think we really need to do is look at what has caused the current problem. And it's this unprecedented spike in housing values coupled with a decrease in um, commercial property values. And there are other states that have programs that address that uh, concern that you'll you've got this tipping scale that's going back and forth in a couple of different ways. California and Massachusetts have different models and I've been looking at both of those to try to think if we can come with, up with another innovation which is a way to sort of stabilize the um, property valuation process across the board in order to, uh, so that people don't have those unanticipated expenses down the line. Thank you, Anne. Dustin? Yeah. We are just about on the precipice of starting our budget cycle. And uh, the news is, is grim in the sense that not only are taxes going up, not only um, has the property stabilization law that went into effect and was not fully funded, uh, that's going to cause some people to have more uh, costs. Um, and then the other issue, too, is that a lot of communities are going to have a rebound very soon. So all of that is putting pressure on the municipality. A couple of things that we've been looking at and I think others uh, could do as well. Um, I'm open to more public education funding and raising the revenue share, but those aren't things you can always count on. So um, regionalization, uh, I might say it over and over and over, but I think a lot of municipalities are thinking about how do we share our resources to um, lessen that burden. The big thing is always, you know, who owns what, um, but regionalization is one way to lower that, that tax. Um, the other thing is a lot of municipalities are thinking about how do we eliminate barriers to bringing in small businesses and other commercial um, entity so that uh, that tax base can can offset having to tax our constituents 
over and over and more and more because we're trying to fund so much. Um, it's something that, that our municipality is thinking about, but um, making sure there's limited barriers to entry for small businesses and other businesses to come in. Um, we've been blessed with some new businesses that have opened up. We're excited for that. Um, but at the same time, I know a lot of, a lot of folks have seen businesses close um, because of high rising costs and everything else. So finding ways to eliminate barriers and, and allow small business uh, with capital to come in would help sort of offset those rising uh, issues that you're seeing within property taxes. Thank you. The um, one issue that comes up repeatedly every time I'm campaigning is property taxes. Buxton was in my district for a little while. The first time I ran for office, they received all of their new revows during campaign season. Next campaign cycle was Gorham. They got all of theirs. <laughs> and this cycle, it's Scarborough. Um, so it's definitely front and center on everyone's mind. I think we have to be cautious every time we move legislation that has a new price tag in the state of Maine, just at the state level, to make sure that we're not overburdening our residents. We need to be able to build strong safety nets, but not um, overburden uh, our property taxpayers as a way to pay for those services. The, um, the, one, the one issue that I've seen in both of my two towns uh, over the last few years is the issue, and I, and I think some of you have also experienced this, of how we fund new schools. And if there was a creative approach that the state could take to recognizing that we have aging educational infrastructure from Kittery to Fort Kent, and we really need to come up with a different model for how we fund it so that when we need to renovate or replace a school, we're not adding an additional property tax burden to those municipal homeowners. We're coming up with another creative solution where the state recognizes the importance of investing in that infrastructure so that we can move forward and make sure we have a robust public education system that doesn't fall completely on the backs of taxpayers. Thank you, Stacy. Rick. It seems like every generation or so we are confronted with another crisis around property taxes because I, I think it's because the the solutions that work, they work for a while and then they fall apart or they start to get a little worn around the edges. And right now, I think many people across the state are seeing um, the changes, the whipsaw in the amount of money that they have to pay in local property taxes really being the, the driving problem. They, they desperately want stability in one part of their life. And this is, this is a place where you, know, you own the same home, you ought to be able to forecast on a regular basis what it is that's going to it's going to cost you to pay for your property taxes and the fact that those have changed for because of revaluations because of other situations has really thrown that into the wind so um, I personally am a great proponent of the homestead exemption in the state of Maine if we do anything we should fully fund the homestead exemption because right now we're not and so it's it's so one of these cases where you know the we, because we reach financial, limits up at the state house we decide to peel back commitments we already made we did that with 55 percent funding of education we did that with the homestead exemption we've done it in lots of other areas so as senator brenner said it's a good idea to make sure that we can fund what we do i believe that particularly among seniors on limited income expanding the homestead exemption to something around 50 percent of the median value of our single family home in maine for people over 65 would make a meaningful impact, but we have to fund it. So that's what I've been, uh, that's what I've been trumpeting um, and hope that uh, we can do that in this coming legislative session. We've got our first request for another minute on this, so go for it, Tim. I'd like to follow up on the um, program that Senator Carney discussed, the property tax uh, uh, deferral program. Last session, we, also, we all also uh, increased eligibility for the property tax fairness credit and we increased the amount of money that could be reimbursed. I think a lot of people have, have missed that yeah. program um, and are focused on the program that I think we all agreed was unsustainable, the freezing the property taxes. Not only unsustainable but tragically unfair. Correct. Yeah, unfair. Yep, uh, exactly. Lots of nodding heads. Um, and this property tax fair, fairness credit can, can provide a senior up to $2,000 to help with their property taxes based on their income. 
Um, I think just as a little PSA, uh, in order to take advantage of that, um, in order to take advantage of that program, you have to file a state income tax return. If you don't make any money, if you don't make enough money to file a tax return, you still need to file that return and you'll get it in the uh, form of a tax credit and it, or a refund. Rick, you want to say something else? Uh, well, no, I just am happy that you mentioned the, uh, the, the property tax fairness credit because that was a big expansion and people don't really realize it. So yeah. I was just I was, uh, doing that and also uh, signaling from your producer. Ah, mm. thank you very much. <laughs> yes, we have about five minutes left. So actually, I wanted to ask each, oh, go, go for it, Anne. Yes, yeah. that we did also increase the homestead exemption this year. Yeah, thank you. So and I want to ask. Of it. We've, we increased the funding of it, but we didn't actually change the underlying mechanics of it. And so we, we still have a ways to go to fund it fully. I think I should have asked this question first. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give it's you each um, 30 seconds to just say, when, if you are elected to the Senate again, or for the first time, what is it that you could point to at the end of your service that you would have said, this is what I accomplished? What's your magic wand thing that if you could get the Senate to do something, what would be your priority? And I'm sorry to only give you 30 seconds, but I'm going to start with you, Tim. So in the last session, I, I uh, sponsored and uh, with strong bipartisan support passed LD2101, which gives municipalities tools uh, in order to hold shoreland zone violators uh, more accountable without costing the town or municipality um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. and uh, and ensure that they do get reimbursed. Um, I think. I have to tell you, thirty seconds. Okay. Up. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Anne. Um, so <laughs> many choices. I think what I will say is that um, I will have continued to make a meaningful difference in um, adopting common sense gun safety legislation that makes our schools and grocery stores and public places safer for Mainers. Thank you, Ann. Dustin. Public education and child care options to, one, either raise or fund public education much better or increase the amount that um, teacher pay would be and assist in the wage scale shifting for a lot of educators. We're seeing too many leaving the profession, um, and we've heard that public education just is a, a huge uh, tax piece. So for me, it'd be public education. Thank you, Dustin. Well, if I could leave with uh, a few Republican friends and maybe a Republican for my book group, that would be great when I leave the legislature. <laughs> um, mostly, I hope to be a part of um, an effort to have a stable state government where state workers feel protected in their job place and we can get good work done together and it increases the public's trust in the legislative process and state government and, and public service as a whole. And um, I'll never stop fighting for reproductive justice. Thank you, Stacy. Rick. Well, as I said at the outset, I think our democracy is in peril, and um, we can work, you know, on these issues. But we, if we don't get control of money in politics, effectively the wrong people are making the decisions for all of us. We need self-determination. Part of self-determination is getting back control over uh, the metastasization of money in politics, and it's a problem here in Maine. I've seen creeping in but it's also uh, something that we need to uh, address at the federal level. I'm gonna do one last rapid fire question here that you're inspiring me at the last minute here. It's, like, it's around this kind of bipartisan cooperation. And um, we see increasing polarization at the local level. We've certainly seen it at the national level. It even exists in the legislature as well. I'd like to ask each of you, is there one thing that you might commit to in the next legislative session to kind of reach across the aisle and develop a closer relationship with those that you might disagree with. And Anne, I'm going to start with you. Thank you. Well, I would continue in the Senate. We don't sit according to party. We're kind of mixed together. Um, and that has been fantastic at helping us forge uh, friendships and working relationships. Um, and I think we could go one step further and perhaps have like a um, monthly tea or social hour that becomes something that everybody really enjoys going to and, and socializing with each other. Thank you, Anne. Dustin? I mean, I'm running as an independent, so I feel like I'm trying to bridge two, <laughs> two thought patterns together. 
if if it were me, I'd want to continue in bringing both sides together to facilitate conversations that have been difficult, which is something that I have um, great pride and skill set in, and, and picking you know issues that are always polarizing and being able to guide a, a meaningful conversation to hear one another. So maybe that would be my way of, of showing how to reach across both aisles. Great, Stacy. I'm going to keep uh, inviting my Republican colleagues out to lunch and talking about everything but politics so that we can know each other as people and learn about each other's lives and families. And I find that that personal relationship is what makes the difference when we're talking about policy. Mm. Rick. Well, Senator Carney and I serve on the Rules Committee. And for the first time in six years, we're actually looking at our rules. And uh, the legislature has been, was a disaster, um, really a managerial disaster over the last session. Um, we have lots of things to work on there. I would like to see as part of that process um, result in less time working on issues in caucus and discussing issues in party caucuses and doing more work um, across the aisle, actually having conversations in the Senate chamber and in other venues where we can actually understand other people's points of view and not just get handed talking points. Thank you. Tim, you got the final word here. I think a lot of people, there is a big misconception that we don't agree on a lot of things. And I think the two parties agree on more than people believe. Um, I just, I think about all of the bills that just go under the hammer um, in, that are, are worked out bipartisanly in the committee and come out with a unanimous report. But I think we can definitely improve on that. And that is a great theme to end on um, of bringing you all together. I heard a tremendous amount of harmony tonight from all of you, even though many of you represent many different kinds of communities, different parties. So I want to thank you all for being here and um, sharing your viewpoints with folks that will be voting in November. And I want to thank all of you who've joined us today for the Senate Candidates Roundtable hosted by the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Thank you. Thank you.